Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul was a church planting missionary. He would take the gospel to a city or a region, and he would establish a church there, and then he would supervise the congregation later through his letters. Galatia is one of those areas where he went, and Galatians is one of those letters that he wrote. And the letters that he wrote by the inspiration of God through the Holy Spirit are given to us as the, the words of Scripture in the New Testament. Most of the books are letters. Most of the letters are authored by the Apostle Paul. He's the human author under the direction of the Spirit of God. Now, the region of Galatia is in, a, in ancient Asia Minor, where several churches now existed. And the last time we went to Israel... Um, we were able, my wife and I and the group that went, we went to Turkey, which is Asia Minor, is modern Turkey, and we saw Galatia, Galatia and Ephesians and some of these places, and we had a wonderful time doing that. But if you can see the map at all, otherwise you can look in your Bibles, but this whole area here is the area of Galatia. And so the missionary journey that, that Paul had, and he had several of them, he came to this area and he, he started churches, um, established churches, and then he had to move on to the next place. He didn't stay very long, uh, typically. And so it's in this area that we're talking about, and the churches, there are several there. So he says in the beginning of the book, Paul, an apostle, to the churches in Galatia. And so I want you to see that first as we come into this new series, a new month, a new year, a new series. Galatians is Paul's book of freedom, the freedom that comes from a grace-only gospel. Now, don't presume that a book about the gospel is unnecessary because... You received the gospel a long time ago. Please don't say, well, if it's gospel, it's for unbelievers, and I can just kind of close my book or maybe twiddle my thumbs or do something for a while. Because the good news of Christ's kingdom is far more than the basic ABCs of salvation. Actually, it provides the A to Z of the Christian life in its entirety. It tells us both how to enter the kingdom of heaven and how to live in that kingdom as well. We'll look at more of the background of the book as we move along in this series. But I'd like us to pray and jump right into the text before us. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. God in heaven, we thank you so much that we can come before you. As we, as we said earlier, it's always in the name of Jesus. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in time of need. And we need, we need something now. We need instruction. We need illumination. We need understanding of the text. Father God, we understand that according to what your word tells us, that there is, there is one interpretation in Scripture. There can be many applications. But the Bible doesn't say everything, because if the Bible says everything, it says nothing. If it says competing things, then it has confusion. The Bible has, has a message because it was written by you. And it makes sense. And I pray you'd help us then to see what you have written. I pray you'd help us to see what the Scripture, what the text means, and then by your Spirit to make application in our own sphere of influence. But Father God, help us to do that as we start a new series. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, there's notes if you want to follow along that way. The first thing I want you to see is the pure gospel. I entitled the message, What is the Gospel Anyway? And if I gave you a chance to stand up, if we handed you a microphone, and you told me what the gospel was, I, I wonder what you would say. There'd be a lot of commonality, right? There'd be a lot of things that we'd have to say the same. But it isn't as easy to... Uh, to define, as you might think, at least the way we've complicated things. I, I googled gospel, and I would encourage you not to do that. It was a little confusing to me. There's a lot of things that people think are the gospel that aren't. I have a better way than googling. I have the scripture in front of me, and I'd like you to see in a moment exactly what the gospel is. The word means good news, right? But good news about what? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 helps. Would you turn there, please? Hold your place here. We'll be parking in Galatians a lot, but just back a few pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, also uh, written by the Apostle Paul. And it's very interesting. I love it when the Scripture gives us this. Um, what is the gospel? Paul says, here's the gospel that I delivered to you. So it's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So he says, here's the gospel. It's what I gave you before. I'm going to give it to you again. Verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, 
that, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. My friends, that is the Gospel. The Gospel is that Christ came, Christ died for our sins, Christ rose again the third day, conquering death, Christ ascended to the Father. The gospel is that message and what it means for us today. It is the good news because if he hadn't come, we couldn't go. If he hadn't redeemed us, we would have no chance on our own. And we're going to see that as we get into the book and into the message today. Because I believe that right off the bat, we have a tendency to complicate what God has made simple. To, to put nuances on the news. And God has made it very clear what he wants us to proclaim to others. That God loves them. He died for their sin. He rose again the third day, proving that he is God. Nobody else has done that. No other religion even claims that, by the way. And then he ascended to the Father, where he makes intercession for us. And the gospel is that, believed in the heart, through the Holy Spirit of God, and a conversion that occurs. I want you to see that this is the same message Paul gave to the Galatians. And yet, they're messing it up. Who's the messenger? Well, let's just make it clear. Paul is the author of the book. We saw that back in Galatians. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. That's typically how he starts his letters. We sign our letters at the end. The apostles signed him at the beginning. Paul, an apostle, to the churches. Here's what I got for you. You know, it's interesting, I want you to know, that in almost every other place where he wrote a letter to the churches, he moves into grace, mercy, and peace. And then he says, I thank God for you. This is a letter where he doesn't do that. This is a letter where he's got a strong message to give. You will not see him saying thanks for you because there are some issues that are going on there. But he is the messenger. He is the author. He is the one who came to the region under the inspiration of the Spirit, under the direction of the Spirit, and he has authored the six chapters of this letter. Everybody knows that. So he has authority to speak because of his position. He says, I am an apostle. And the word apostle means one cent. Uh, we kiddingly say, if, if, you, if you forget what it is, grab a penny. You know, one cent. One cent with a, with a divine mission. One cent with a message. In, in one sense, we are doing the work of an apostle if we go out with the gospel. But we are not given the position of apostle because that was given to 12, 12, original 12 people only. We saw that this morning in our Sunday school class. Jesus prayed all night. He brought the disciples up. And from within the disciples, he chose 12 apostles. And we see that then that Paul is an apostle. Now, he's an apostle born out of time, as he mentions in the scripture, because he um, took the place of, of Judas, who betrayed the Lord. They were down to 11, and the Lord took Paul in his conversion, and we'll see that in a moment, and I believe added him to the twelve, and that those are the only apostles that we have. Now, they were called, they were set apart, they were sent out. The New Testament church sent Paul and Barnabas on a mission trip, and so they were doing the work of an apostle because they were sent, but Barnabas is not called an apostle ever in Scripture. So again, we can be sent, and we are sent, but the position of apostle was very key and very important. Paul is unique. Did you notice the first part of the verse? He says, I'm an apostle not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. He says, not from men. That means he wasn't sent out by this. He didn't get his calling his credentials because of a bunch of ordination uh, counsel. Nor through man, singular. Not from men, not through man. That's not a mistake in your text. He did not get this from man. He got it from God himself, and he is unique in this way. He says that my calling, my authority, my position, my apostleship came directly from God. And nobody else would doubt that because they knew the story. You know the story of Paul's conversion? It's in Acts chapter 9. Sometime I encourage you to look at that. I'll, I'll give you a couple of verses in a moment. God knocked Paul Saul at the time, knocked him off his horse, converted him against his will on the road to Damascus. Paul wasn't looking to be saved that day. He didn't pray a sinner's prayer. He didn't walk an aisle. He bit the dust. He heard a voice. 
he lost his eyesight and he was gloriously saved. Remember, Saul was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ and thought he was doing God a favor, but God had other plans. So he snatched him. He arrested him. He stole him from the devil and he made him a chosen vessel for righteousness. And here's some of the verses from Acts 9 that tell us that. Verse 4. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Then he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now that would be a kick to the gut because Saul's whole life was about persecuting followers of Jesus. It is hard for you to, to kick against the goads. And so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And I want you to see there that God grabbed this man and made him his child. Saul already thought he was a, a believer, a follower in God, not this Jesus person. And yet God said, I want you, you're mine, and that was how it happened. Now that's probably not the salvation experience you have. How many people... Last week I asked two weeks ago how many had been saved at Billy Graham. How many people fell off a horse you near know, the light from heaven? And right, it's a very unique thing. But that's the time that he was called. And later on, God says, "I will show this man how much he will suffer for me." Saul did not have an opinion. Saul did not have a choice in the sense of him coming to God asking. There's will involved, but God initiates. God brings people to him to Himself. And he gives us a chance to choose or not choose. And the only right answer is, yes, I will choose. Because God has opened our eyes. And God has opened our heart. Now, I just want to say as an aside, I don't believe there are any apostles today. Sometimes you hear about churches that have an apostle instead of a pastor. Hey, I'm not going to fight over that. I don't really care to fight about that kind of stuff. But I don't believe that that's the case. There were 12 that were given to us. Um, we are all able to do the work of an evangelist, the work of an apostle. But in a very special way, there were these 12. And Paul, among the 12, was in a league by himself. An apostle um, was one who met the risen Christ, was one who was taught by Christ personally, and that would not be any of us today. Paul fits in because of the vision. He saw Christ in the vision, and Christ talked to him in that special way. Paul calls himself that. I'm the 12th. I'm an apostle outside the regular way, after the fact, uh, and so on. But I want you to see that, first of all, he has the authority because of his position, but also because of his preaching. Verses 8 and 9, chapter 1. Even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you already, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Paul was the one who took the gospel to the region of Galatia. He was the one who led them to Christ. He was the one that gave 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He became their spiritual daddy in the process. Have you ever led someone to Christ before and had the joy and blessing of being their spiritual parent? I, I, I love that. I've had people that I've been able, by God's grace, I've been the one that shows them the way, and they pray to receive Christ. And in a sense, then, I'm, I'm their spiritual father. John talks about that. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. He's not talking about physical progeny. He's talking about those through his ministry. And that's what we see here. So he has great authority. And Paul is putting on his daddy voice. He's putting on his stern voice. He says, I have a message to you. Verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. False teachers have come to Galatia, and they have a works-based gospel. And Paul's not going to take it anymore. I refuse to let you do He's angry at the agitators. He's astonished at the Galatians because they're so gullible. They started drifting away from the truth, turning away soon after having received it. And so we see that, that Paul has authority, he's the messenger, and he has the opportunity, the privilege to do this. So what is the message? Because they're getting falling away from it, he just reminds them. And I want you to take a moment to rejoice in the next few verses. I would like you to rejoice in verses 4 
and 5. Let me read verse 3 first. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please put your name in there. If you're trusting in Christ today, put your name in verse 4. Who gave himself for, for my sins, Doug's sins, that he might deliver Doug from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. This is the gospel that he needs to remind them of because they've lost the simplicity and they've been adding things to, to the gospel. They've been adding things to grace. They've been adding works. Rejoice in these verses. This is what Jesus did for us, just like he did it for the Galatians. And one word comes to my mind here, and I'd like you to write it down. The key word for understanding the pure gospel is this, provision. Provision. God has provided. You, you cannot save yourself. You cannot birth yourself, right? It has to be done for you. It cannot be done by you. And that's what separates us from all human religion. Religions say, do this, do that, do the other. What, what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Done. There is no do. There is done. There is believing. There is trusting in what God has done. It is not behavior. It is belief. And that was the gospel that Paul received. And that was the, the gospel that the Galatians received. And that's the gospel that we receive. How many here worked really hard to get their salvation? Now, if you think you did, be honest, but we need to talk. We know we didn't, right? How good, just how good were you to go to heaven? Eh, not good enough. You can't be good enough because you have to be perfect. Only Christ is perfect. He came and he took our place. And according to the scripture here, he gave himself, not for his sins, but for mine, that he might deliver me, rescue me. And that's what I want us to look at for a moment because they had forgotten it. The gospel is something that is provided for us. In the pure gospel, God rescues us. Jesus didn't come to help us clean up our act. Jesus didn't come to help us learn a moral code to live our lives by. He gave himself for our sins, on our behalf, in our place, to deliver us from this current evil age. So we, we looked at Christmas two weeks ago. Was it just two weeks ago? It was last year. We had Christmas together. And it was the incarnation. Listen now, the incarnation was a rescue mission. The incarnation was the greatest rescue mission of all time. Because we were dead in sin, and we were dying physically and spiritually. And God so loved the world that he sent his son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's delivered us. That's the rescue that we're talking about here. And Paul says to the Galatians, you know this. You've been rescued. You've been snatched. You've been drawn away. You've, you've, you've been given a seat at the table. And now somebody is turning your head. I'm astonished as a pastor. I know what Paul was feeling. What are you thinking about? Somebody has hijacked the gospel and you've gone along for the ride. Somebody has corrupted your conversion and you're okay with it and you're passing that same filthy message to others. Jesus did all that we needed to do or couldn't do. He saved us from our sins. That was the reason for his coming, and he made us a new creation in him. Would you say this verse with me, because it's a wonderful verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, together. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. My friends, we are under new management. He doesn't turn over a new leaf. He gives us a whole new plant. He gives us what we could not get on our own. Never, never, never think that God's impressed with you or me, because he isn't. But never, ever, ever doubt his love for you, because he loved us with an everlasting love before there was an us to love. Christ died from eternity past for us. And God can never love you more than he loves you right now, because he loves you completely. And he can never love you less than he loves you right now. I'm so glad it's not about me. I am so fickle. I am a fickle follower. I don't want to be fickle. I just have a tendency to do that. But he, he did this for us. In the pure gospel, he rescued us. Never forget it. And then he redeemed us. To redeem means to purchase. 
to purchase from sin and Satan. When did Jesus pay that price? On the cross, when he became the sacrifice for all the sins of the world. Remember when it says, when he came back and they wanted to grab him, when they, when they saw it was Jesus, he said, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended to the Father. What does that mean, and why does that matter? Because when he died for us, he paid the penalty for our sins, he took that payment up to the Father to present it, and the Father accepted it. And because the Father accepted the payment for our sins, you and I can go to heaven. Listen, every day you wake up and you're not in hell is a good day. Because I and you, we deserve hell, and God's given us heaven. He took us from the guttermost to the uttermost, and it's because of his love for us. It was never because of us, and it will never be because of us. If he was to withdraw his grace today, we'd be lost. Because it, it, it wasn't my good works that got his attention in the beginning, and I haven't impressed him since. It still isn't about me. And that's the problem of Galatians, and that's the problem of, of, of grace, is that we start adding things to the, to the gospel, and we also add things to the Christian life. And so he said, no charge, paid in full. You know, um, we had our furnace cleaned. Every year we have our furnace cleaned. It's a good thing to do. It's, I like being warm in the winter. And so we had them come, and they, we paid them. We gave them a check. And the next day there was water coming out of the furnace. Well, I don't know. I didn't think it was a a water-producing uh, part of my house. And so he had warned us there might be some water, so I'm cleaning it up. The next day, I'm cleaning it up. The next day, I'm cleaning it up. There's just all kinds of water. So I called him, and I said, am I supposed to have water spew a gallon at a time, two gallons at a time? And the lady said, where's it coming from? And I said, I don't know, my swimming pool? This is coming from my furnace. I was a little, a little snarky. So anyway, she said, well, that's not normal. And I thought, well, good, then I'm we are on the same page there, so she sent somebody over. And he came, and he fixed it. There was, I don't know, something. I wasn't there. I just write the checks. Anyway, I was at church. So I gave a check for $78. We sent it in the mail, actually. And yesterday, yesterday, I got this letter from Modern Heating. It looked like a bill. You know, I'm thinking, oh, really? I mean, and I opened it up, and it was my check. My check with a uh, marker all over it that they were sending back to me, and the statement said, zero. There were zeros all over the place. You don't owe anything. Now, that's a great start to the new year. I just got $78, right? I can go out to eat somewhere. In a far greater and more significant way, that is what God did for us in salvation. I had a bill. I, just, I had worked hard for my condemnation. I'm a sinner. And the Lord paid the penalty in full, and he took his payment and put it on my sin account. I didn't deserve that. I deserved the full weight of the law. And he says now, Doug Carlson paid in full. That's what he gives. That's, he nailed that to the cross. And that's my life and that's your life. We've been redeemed. And because he's eternal, we're having eternal life. So verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In fact, verse 4, it's according to the will of the Father. Again, he did it. Not me. So, in the gospel, in the pure gospel, we see this. God rescues us. God purchases us. And it's to his glory. We didn't deserve it. We didn't design it. We can't do it. No, sir. The gospel is God's provision for man. Ah, I love that. That should be enough right now to take us through a couple of new years. But right away, people start messing up with the message. And so there's a perverted gospel, and we need to get to that part, because that's why he wrote the book. He wrote the book to say, after the reminder, what are you doing? What's happened to you? But here's why it's important, my friends, because we don't live in Galatia, but I think we do the same thing. I think that we add things to, to the gospel. I think that we add things to this, the Christian life. If you do this, you're spiritual. If you don't do this, you're not. I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be. In fact, I think our gospel is, is corrupted. He says here in verse 6, then, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ that he just mentioned about to a different gospel. Then he corrects himself in verse 7, right? Which is not another gospel, right? He says in verse 6, there is a, a different gospel, but actually it's not a different gospel. It's a distorted gospel. It's a non-gospel. It's a reversal of the gospel. There are some who agitate you, trouble you, and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And so we have this, this, excuse me, stupid, I'm amazed, and sudden, so suddenly, 
that you have changed and gone away from the things that God gave you in the first place. It's inconceivable. It's inconceivable. And we need to look at the, the specifics because people are perverting the gospel even today. People who call themselves Christians. Maybe people who are Christian, but they've lost sight. You cannot add anything to the expression of the gospel of Christ. And they were doing that. The pure gospel starts with our acceptance by a loving God and leads us to follow Him. Now listen, it's very important. The true gospel starts with our acceptance by God and leads us to follow Him because we love Him. Every false gospel starts with us trying to get accepted by God. See the difference? We start with accepting. I love you because, because I love you. And then, oh, because of that, we want to serve Him. But the false gospel says, do this, get His approval, do this, get His acceptance. Right? And, and see the difference? And that's what they were doing in Galatia. They were adding something to the gospel. And so they were getting it backwards, demanding works to gain God's approval. They called for good works to be saved, whereas Scripture speaks of good works being the result. So they're reversing the order. And when you reverse the order of the gospel, you reverse the gospel. And when you reverse the gospel, you renounce the God who gave it. Do you see why Paul is a little bit hot under his ministerial collar? This cannot stand. Can I ask you a question? Do we sometimes kind of reverse the gospel when we share it with our unsaved friends? Have we made it sound like there are steps to salvation? Things that we must do rather than trusting in something already done? People aren't saved because they show emotion. I get emotional all the time. It doesn't mean I'm saved. People aren't saved because they quote unquote surrender their lives to Christ. Because the question is, have I surrendered enough? Now listen, listen to what I'm saying. Have I surrendered enough? Have I really given it? That becomes performance. It's not about how much I surrender. It's not about how much faith I have. It's not the level of our faith. It's the object of our faith. Even a child can be saved. How much do they know? Even a child can be saved. How much faith can they have? How much faith does it take to move a mountain? Remember Jesus said, Read a mustard seed? It's not the amount of your faith. It's not the display of your emotions. It's not the things that you give up. It is coming to Christ, letting Him rescue you, redeem you, birth you, convert you. And I think sometimes we make it sound like there are steps to the gospel. Do these three things and He'll save you. No. Birth. Birth happens. He saves us. He saves us. We need to be careful that we don't add, and our terminology doesn't confuse people. If we're saved by what we do, performance becomes our Savior rather than Christ. So, first of all, please be careful when you share the gospel. Make sure people know that, that it is not... Don't add to... Don't add anything. I had a pastor one time. I've showed you this before. He went like this, put his finger up, and he said, If I believe that getting to heaven requires trusting in Christ and doing this, I'm bending my finger, then that's a false gospel. If it's Christ plus this... It's not the gospel. Christ plus anything. Christ plus anyone. It is Christ alone. Paul is the example. Paul didn't ask. Paul was given. The other thing that we do then as Christians is to add something to the experience of the gospel. In other words, now that we're saved, we, 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 we set up this, this hierarchy. You're spiritual if you do this. And you're unspiritual if if you do the other, or if you don't, don't we do that? I, I grew up in a situation like that, and it, it wasn't my parents per se. It was, the, it was the place in which we lived. It was the churches. It was the, it was the belief that you had to do, 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 not to be saved. But again, if, if I wasn't, see, here's the thing. If my good works can't save me, then my bad works can't lose me after I'm saved, right? In other words, it's not about me at all. There's so much we could say. I'm glad i got months to do it. Um, even temptation for sin. Sometimes we think the way to, to stop being tempted by sin is to do certain things. And we, we beat ourselves up and we try something. Then we have success and then we say, look what I did. You, you can't resist sinning without the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, there's things that we've got to be careful about, but it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that. You should pray. And trust him. They, they've done so well in the beginning. They were saved by grace alone, but now they're measuring their Christian lives 
not by God's provision, but by, God, by, by their own performance. And here's the next word. The perverted gospel is, is characterized by performance, not provision. Performance. Look at chapter 3 in Galatians. This is, wow, he's really getting riled up here in chapter 3. We'll get there in a couple of weeks, so put your helmets on for that message, right? Oh, foolish Galatian, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Now, you know this. You, you've seen this. You know that it was grace. This only I want to learn from you, he says in verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? There's a tendency in Christendom to make a bunch of rules. You know churches like that today. I know you do, because I I know some today. I know some in our community. They regulate everything. There's a right way to eat. There's a right way to dress. There's a right way to schedule your time. All these rules and regulations, and if you do that, then you're good, and if you don't, you're not. You're not doubting your salvation. You're just not a really good, not a good camper, not a good flock member. And they use shame and guilt to keep the flock in line. You know what happens. That's called legalism. And that's my concern. Is that somehow we get to the place beyond provision and about performance. Let me let you in on a little secret. Spirituality is determined by walking by the Spirit, and that's it. Not by some random list of do's and don'ts. Performance-based Christianity makes us man-pleasers. Look at verse 10. Man-pleasers instead of God-pleasers. For do I now persuade men... Paul says, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant for Christ. My friends, that's the essence of legalism. To do something because the, the board says I should. The pastor says I should. The doctrines of the church, the constitution, the tradition. That is not... There is freedom in Christ. What does that mean? If, if you've got to walk around being afraid that you might have your hair a little too long or, or you might you know, wear the wrong thing. It's not about that. Yes, there are standards. We're not talking immodesty. We're all adults here. We're talking about determining spirituality by how well you perform. Is that the gospel that you believed in? I don't think it is. And the gospel that saved you is the gospel that keeps you. And so it's very important for us to look at what we do and why we do that. Because I know a lot of people who are works-based, even in their faith. And I know what they're against. I just don't know what they're for. They're without grace. They're without joy. They're mechanical in their experience of the Lord. They have the Holy Spirit, but they're not too happy about it, you know? They'll say, God loves you, but don't let it go to your head. You know, that type of a thing. Instead of just being rejoicing in the freedom that comes from Christ. Don't regulate the redeemed. Don't handcuff the holy. Allow the Spirit of God to be the Spirit of God... The Bible says in, in John 3, we saw that before, right? That the, the, the wind blows where it wants, and you can't see where it comes from or where it goes. And that's how the Spirit works in salvation. Can we trust the Spirit of God to work in our hearts without us regulating, packaging, and sending it in the mail for somebody else? That's the message. I thank God that we're that I pastor a church named Grace. is one of the most wonderful blessings of my life. We were talking about merging with Lakeview, and we were trying to, you know, what to call the church. Like, that's the big issue. But, oh, well. People have concerns, right? And I say, it has to have grace. It has to have grace in the title. Well, you just, because it's your church. I said, no, because it's grace. It, it, I, there's a lot of other great words, but it's grace. It's all of grace. And I love the fact that missionary is our middle name, and I love the fact that grace is our first name. Grace. Gracious. Isn't that, much, isn't that community sounding? Isn't that warm, fuzzy sound? In a good way. So when somebody asks me, and I tell them about grace, grace is a Jesus idea. Grace is a Christian idea. The world doesn't get it. And that's our opportunity to share in a gracious, wonderful way. And Paul is so upset about it. He says, if anybody preaches a false gospel, let them be accursed, in verse 8. But then he says, so you don't think you made a mistake, in verse 9, he says it all again. Did you get that point, he says? If you preach a gospel where you add works, or a Christian life where you live by works to be spiritual, that that's, that is a, that is a condemned, that's something to be condemned. Don't switch performance for provision. Don't add works to grace or you're in trouble. This is because grace and works are like spiritual oil and water. 
Romans 11, 6 says, if, if by grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. But if it is of works, then it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What's he saying? Keep them a mile apart. Grace and works. And we're saved by grace through faith. And by the way, we're not saved by faith either. We are saved what? By grace through faith. And the faith came to us from God's hand anyway. So we're never saved through our faith. We're saved because of God's grace. Our activation of that is through faith. But we're saved by grace. That's what the Bible says, right? For by grace we are saved. Through faith. And then not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Not of works, lest any man would boast. And we would. So I hope that the, uh, the, the, the message and the work uh, the message in the uh, series will open your eyes. One commentator calls the book Dynamite. So let's have some dynamite in the next few weeks. Let's see what God has for us. And let's recognize that we need to believe the pure gospel to be saved and live the pure gospel from here on out. And with that voice of wisdom from that child, we're going to close in prayer. God in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege. Thank you for Galatians. Father, help us to, to, to have a great time in this book, in this series. Show us what you need to show us. We're not afraid here, Father. We're not standing on tradition. We're not standing by something. If you show us it's not there, we want the truth. We want the pure gospel. Help us, Father. Deliver us from adding to the unaddable. Help us keep us from making the gospel a non-gospel. And help us, Father, to grow in grace and the knowledge of thee, we pray. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.